Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Hot Topics with the Hundred and Family Practice Residency Program. Uh, my name is Scott Allen. I'm the CEO for the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I'm really glad you're all joining us tonight, and thank the, the program for having, uh, having the talk with us on integrative medicines. Let me tell you just a little bit about the FMEC before I turn it over to Dr. Meyer to get started. Um, we are a regional coalition of 14 states in the District of Columbia. And in that area, there are about 60 medical schools, departments of family medicine, and about 190 family medicine residency programs. Our biggest activity, as you may know, is our annual meeting, which happens each fall. It's actually next week. So we're a little busy, but we're excited. We have about 800 people coming, including over 300 medical students who can learn about family medicine and meet the residency training program. We also have a, a series of awards we give out every year. We do learning collaboratives on topics such as integrative health, but also on things like um, low birth weight, on uh, hereditary cancers in women. We're just about to start that one up. So we're trying to do more outside the annual meeting and lots of ways you can get involved. Um, our, our goals really are threefold. We like to pr uh, promote family medicine and primary care to medical students by bringing them to the meeting and helping them learn more about family medicine. We like to support residents as they're in training to give them presentation opportunities, but also to help them transition into careers by learning about practice options and things like loan management. Um, and we like to help strengthen family medicine residency training programs by getting them together, helping them learn from each other, giving them presentation opportunities and sharing shared learning experiences. Um, so with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dr. Meyer to talk about tonight's topic. Thank you, Scott. Hello, everybody. Nice to see such a nice group. I'm Monica Meyer. I am one of the family practice faculty at the Hunterdon Family Practice Residency Program. Um, thank you all for taking precious hour out of your free time this evening uh, to join. So the topic for tonight is integrative medicine in residency. Um, my plan is to go through just a small handful of slides um, going over the basics of what is and what isn't integrative medicine, sort of break it into some manageable areas um, to understand what some of the, the regions and, and types of opportunities there are, and briefly to go over how we incorporate integrative medicine in the integrative medicine track at Hunterdon. And in large part, I'd really like to give you an opportunity to ask questions or share experiences to make this the most for you. So let me see if I can share my screen here. And we'll get started. All right, can people see the screen? Yes? Thumbs up, thank you, appreciate that. All right, so here's our hot topic for this evening. Let's talk a little bit about what is and what isn't integrative medicine. As soon as it allows me to advance the slide. Aha, interesting. Which it is not doing, sorry. Always fun having tech issues, but I seem to have a frozen screen here, Scott. I'm gonna stop sharing and try that again. Let me try one more time with that. Uh, let me bring it up this way and see if that works better. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working any better. Um, Would you like me to share your slides and you can just say advance? Sure, that sounds good. Okay, let's do that. We'll give that a shot. This is why we have backups. How's that look? That looks great. Okay, okay. okay. next slide, please. That seems to be working better. Thank you. All right. So a couple of key components for integrative medicine. Integrative medicine really focuses on the whole person, the whole individual, both on the health and the wellness. It specifically is not disease-oriented approach. It is a health-oriented and wellness approach. A lot of what we learn in medical school focuses on the diseases. 
it is what's called a holistic approach. So we've all heard about the biopsychosocial model, but we also need to consider the cultural, the spiritual, and the whole context of the community that the person is living in. So incorporating some of those social determinants of health. It very much involves um, your relationship as the provider with your patient and how therapeutic this relationship is. It really is part of their health, their well being, and their healing. So, what you bring to the encounters makes a big difference. It is informed by all available evidence and it uses all therapeutic options. So, that means what we learn as far as conventional medicine, um, that's considered that which we all learn in medical school, um, and also complementary therapies. And we'll go through some of the lists of complementary therapies in a moment. Um, there's a whole other area which is important. Next slide, please. And that's the concept of self-care, which has gotten a lot of um, playtime recently. Um, you can't give what you don't have. So we've realized that when providers are depleted, they have no resources. And as I was just saying, it's very important what you bring to the patient interaction because your interaction with them is part of the healing process. So if you bring being frazzled and being distracted, you are not contributing to the healing process. Um, and think of healing more in a bigger holistic term. It doesn't always mean curing. There's a very big distinction there. So most residency programs at this point, as mandated by the ACGME, which accredits all of residency programs, requires that everybody has a wellness program. But we can break the wellness into a, a few um, intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So there's the support that each institution provides. Um, for example, that's duty hour limits, one example. There's how your residency program sponsors activities. Maybe there's a morale building day that's built in, or maybe there's a retreat that's built in. Um, and then there are individual care practices. What do you do on your off hours when you're not at an integrative medicine workshop <laughs> um, for the evening for an hour um, to help take care of yourself? Are you getting adequate sleep? How is your personal nutrition? Do you deal with um, and contact the, the faith providers that are important to you? Those kinds of things. So self-care is a key component of um, integrative medicine's mandate as well. So let's move on to um, a couple of the broad regions and areas within integrative medicine. It's a vast area to learn, thank you. So I'm gonna break this down into about six or seven broad areas. And the reason I do this is every time I see a patient and I wish to apply some integrative approaches, um, this helps me to organize and not just jump to one or two things that a given patient might be asking me about. So I think in each of these categories, and I think whether there are opportunities or options in each one of these categories. So lifestyle medicine, for example, we were just talking about sleep, um, your exercise, are you connected with your family and your community? Um, are you tending to spirituality? Um, do you have supportive relationships? All of these things are independent factors in someone's health and well being, and also influence chronic conditions that we are often taking care of. Sometimes nutrition is included in lifestyle, but I think this is such a huge area and so important that I've broken this out into its own category. There are so many different sources and types of diets and nutritional advice. Many of our patients, and maybe some of us are feeling overwhelmed by all the options and by a lot of the conflicting information that's out there. Um, but pretty much every single condition that we see in the office can be influenced by the nutrition of the individual. So a lot of opportunities there. Manual medicine, this will incorporate things like physical therapy, osteopathic manual therapies, massage, and chiropractic care. And next slide, please. Four more broad general areas. 
there are so many opportunities in mind-body medicine. And what I really like here is that my patients get ownership and they get to control things um, once they've learned some of these techniques. So helpful. And many times once they've learned the techniques, the price point, which is free, um, really works for a lot of folks in a healthcare industry where cost is a major issue for just about everybody. So this might include things like different types of breathing techniques, mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, guided imagery, clinical hypnosis, various forms of meditation, Tai Chi and Qigong. A lot of opportunity here and much to learn, very versatile. Probably the category where um, I get the most questions from my patients is in botanicals, supplements, and vitamins. And frequently it will be, hey doc, can I take this or is it okay to take that? Um, having a working knowledge about um, the safety of our herbal and supplement industry, knowing which manufacturers to recommend, having some idea about what works, what doesn't work, and knowing where to find reliable information as we have a growing body of studies and evidence is really important. Moving on to whole systems. These are complete healthcare systems that have thousands of years of history. Um, they include traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, naturopathy, just as three examples. Um, and all of these all incorporate um, holistic and preventative approaches long before uh, what we've learned in medical school and Western medicine started incorporating these ideas. So some rich traditions that really can be helpful for our patients. And then the last broad category that I'd like to mention is energy medicine or bioenergetics. And some examples here are Reiki, therapeutic touch, and Qigong. Um, and there are certain conditions and some patients that really benefit. Chronic pain is one of the areas where I might implore some of and include some of these approaches. So this is just a, a broad rubric or organizational pattern in terms of how to think of various uh, integrative options. Um, that I hope you'll find helpful when you start thinking about how and what you want to learn and how you might want to engage with your patients. And I'm going to invite whatever questions that you have in just a moment. Um, one last slide, please, Scott. I wanted to take a moment to let you know um, that Hunterdon has an integrative medicine in residency track. It is an option. We've been starting our residents usually halfway through the first year. That gives you about two and a half years to participate in the IMR track. And on the call today, I think we have two or three of our residents that I'm hoping will be able to tell you a little bit more about their firsthand experience. We've made it a four-pronged approach. We have didactic sessions. We partner with the University of Arizona. Um, who have put together a 200 hour online curriculum that provides a lot of the didactics. So from the comfort of your home, you can look at it and go through the basic didactics in a variety of areas, including all that, that I had covered there. We meet on a monthly basis at Hunterdon um, for all the residents who are participating. We do integrative case discussions and we do various experientials. So you get a bit of experience learning some of the mind-body techniques. You get to learn how to work with herbs, how to make say a salve or a tincture and get some hands-on experience. You learn a little bit about probiotics and prebiotics um, and how you can incorporate things and also some hands-on with nutrition. Um, as you work your way through, there's, um, you will also get an integrative medicine patient care session. It usually runs about once a month. And the idea here is to have dedicated teachers who can precept you in the office where you have your own patients and where you can start to implement and really apply some of the techniques and the knowledge that you are learning. And then lastly, um, 
there is a uh, an online community and this community gets together at an integrative medicine in residency annual conference where you can meet other residents who are also in the IMR at their home institutions. There are currently about 80 family medicine programs across the country that offer the um, online curriculum through University of Arizona. And at the conference, you have a chance to network with them um, and hear from thought leaders firsthand uh, in terms of what's going on and where the, where the current research is. So that's a little bit about integrative medicine, just some broad strokes, and a little bit about how we've put together our track at Hunterdon. Um, I'd kind of like to open things up to questions um, or experiences. Um, and as I said, we have several of our residents from Hunterdon uh, on the call. So I invite you all to, to chime in and to answer about experiences. So if you wouldn't mind, if you have a question, um, please uh, introduce yourself and where you're from, and let me open things up at this point. Thanks, Scott. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm from Rutgers NJMS. Um, this question. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, this question is both for Dr. Meyer and the residents. Um, could you just give some examples of integrative medicine techniques that you've used with patients for anxiety or other kinds of complaints? I'm going to throw that open. Let's see. We've got um, Antoinette and Disha and Sarah, who are from Hunterdon. Any of the three of you want to answer? Um, hi, Sarah. So I'm one of our third years. Um, yeah, so one of the things I um, tend to frequently use is uh, square breathing. It's um, easy to teach in the office. Um, and then um, things like gratitude journaling. Um, and then in terms of supplements, um, I, I mean, it kind of depends on the person, but different things like um, ashwagandha, like saffron, um, lemon balm, things like that um, and I just kind of fine tune it based on the patient um, and their lifestyle. Um, also, uh, if it's more like an anxiety or a depression type, uh, like one more so than the other, um, like just medications that they may be on, things like that, I tend to um, use those kind of like uh, those most frequently, I think. Um, I don't know if Tisha or Antoinette, you guys have anything. Um, additional. Sarah, whatever you mentioned first, you were uh, you, your connection wasn't great. Can you say what you had mentioned first? Um, the rest came through square, well. Square breathing. That I teach the patients square breathing, and I mean I've even used it overnight um, with patients that I get calls about that are um, anxious, difficult, like uh, difficulty sleeping because of that, or like they feel short of breath because they're anxious and having a hard time sleeping. I mean, I just start breathing with them at like three in the morning and then they feel so much better. Um, but I feel like it's a quick, easy technique that I can teach um, in the office and that they can use on, uh, like on a day to day, um, that it's just really helpful. Um, so I tend to use that quite frequently. Very nice. Disha and Antoinette? Yes, definitely some of the things that Sarah mentioned I've also used, um, you know, in terms of supplements, I've used things like rhodiola or red yeast rice. But sort of outside of that, I feel like I can kind of better answer this question with like why I decided to do IMR in the first place. Um, and I think in general, I was interested in treating the person as a whole body holistic approach. But I found that my medical school experience really didn't teach me things about things like nutrition. Um, and like, if a patient came to me with like a, should I be on the supplement? I didn't really even know like how to look at or like a resource to find out if this is appropriate for that patient. Um, so I think for me, like even outside of like my dedicated IMR experience, I found that when I've talked to patients about like diet and exercise, this curriculum um, has been really helpful in general. Yeah, I agree with Disha. Um, you know, a lot of 
our patients that are coming into family medicine, they don't necessarily want, you know, to take like an SSRI for anxiety or things like that. So I think having other options and like other supplements um, are beneficial and actually having like a good source, like the IMR curriculum is beneficial um, and just kind of use other alternatives um, to really treat the patient because sometimes it's not, they don't want traditional treatments. And I think that's where IMR is really comes in handy and giving you like other tools like in your pocket to use. Um, so like the, the tools like Sarah mentioned um, that are good or journaling and things like that. And, you know, those those ways are effective to treat, you know, anxiety and things like that. And giving other options is uh, a beneficial, I think. So that's where IMR is kind of um, like a good curriculum to kind of go through. Thank you all. I'm hoping we answered your question, Laura. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like it gives you like a lot of extra tools on top of like traditional medical training. Yeah, so I use the term conventional because traditional can be interpreted different ways. Does traditional mean whatever, whatever your cultural tradition was or does traditional mean what you learned in medical school? So that's a little nebulous there. So when I say conventional, I, um, that refers to more our pharmaceuticals um, versus our complementary therapies. I also find it's important to have the perspective of when it is absolutely crucial and important to use conventional resources. So if I have a patient, for example, that's having chest pain and a cholesterol that's you know 500, I'll exaggerate here a little bit, um, and an LDL that is 400, and they're asking me whether they can take red yeast rice, no, I'm sorry, you really can't. That's not, you know, it's, it's, it's having a, a, a goal-oriented conversation. It's knowing what the um, perspective is and what's appropriate um, and knowing what it can and cannot do. And that's important for any of our resources, whether it's a pharmaceutical or whether it's a botanical or whether it is a mind-body technique. So all of it and, and looking for evidence equally on all fronts, not just on one front. Um, so that's one of the things that I think is important as well. Other questions? Oh, yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead. So go how ahead. about Samantha? And then I see Raphael. One, then two. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. I'm Sam from PCOM. I met some of you last month yes. um, at Hunterdon. I have a specific question about like resources. So I know you guys mentioned that you, like once you're in the integrative medicine track, you have access to some of these online databases and stuff, but are there any more widely available resources for finding out which um, supplements are like proven to be more efficacious or like which things shouldn't mix with other things and um, if there's any research going on with that. Great question. Um, Hunterdon team, anybody wanna answer this? Well, you guys are thinking, let me start. Um, so the Natural Medicines Database is a wonderful resource to use. Probably the biggest limitation there is that it costs. Um, so there, there is a fee for an annual subscription for it. Um, a lot of institutions actually offer it. So you can check and see if your institution already has an institutional license and, and has availability there. Um, so, and I see uh, someone says that you have access to that through PCOM. Fabulous. So start exploring that. It is a wonderful resource. It is being updated. It is very well organized in terms of the categories. Um, so listed as usually you can look up a particular herb or supplement. You can also look up a particular manufacturer. So there's Consumer Lab, which will compare the consistency and the purity of various supplements. Um, and the Natural Medicines Database will give you some idea whether things are likely to be effective, unlikely to be effective, unclear whether it's effective, can't say because of lack of evidence, but put it into the same 
um, consistent organization patterns so you can compare from one thing to the next. So that's one thing which I like to use. One of my other resources that I really like using, the University of Wisconsin has an integrative medicine program and they have a lot of handouts that are open source and available to anybody. So I encourage you to explore those as well. Um, I will oftentimes, if I'm really doing a consultation for a patient, um, they have some really good handouts that are patient oriented. They also have some modules that are for clinicians. Um, so that's an open source thing, which I like to use. There's the, um, I'm blanking on it, uh, the NIH website also has a whole segment, which I recommend using and is well-balanced information. So not just this is bad, but this has evidence, this does not have evidence, this has fair quality evidence, this has good evidence, um, so that you can continue to look things up. And also through the NIH, you can, um, you can check on ongoing research and articles that are being published. Um, anybody think of any other resources? Um, I don't think anything besides the one that you mentioned, but I just wanted to say that the IMR curriculum also does a good job of highlighting um, evidence be behind all the things that are recommended. So whether like yeah. this is something that is suggested, but there's not a lot of evidence to back this, um, they do a pretty good job of that. And I think there's a search function. So sometimes I kind of just look things up if I'm on the go and it, it'll pop up. Great suggestion. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Sam. Raphael, I think you had the next question. Oh yes, uh, hello, Dr. Mayer and all the residents that are joining this evening event. So I, I would want to know in related to the feedback from all the faculties and do you receive uh, training during the, the program, uh, 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 feedback from other, uh, from other specialties, from other faculties that belongs to other specialties, and how does this interaction between? So your question is whether we're getting, whether our residents are getting feedback from other specialists. Um, so I, would I'll start and say that for the most part, as you do your rotations with cardiology, with gynecology, et cetera, um, at the end of every month, you're getting feedback sessions. Um, and I think you also, um, our residents also get to assess the um, specialists and their faculty as well. So it is a, a 360 degree, is what it's called an all around evaluation process. It's not just one way. So we try and keep an eye on our rotations and how things are going and how many opportunities and how well our residents are being taught on those rotations to make sure that there's still good educational opportunities as much as they're being evaluated in terms of how they're doing. Um, gonna open that up to Team Hunter in here um, to fill in further details. Yeah, I think um, like Dr. Meyer said, we definitely do get feedback at the end and we get an opportunity to give feedback as well. Um, but I think our like team in general, whether whatever rotation you're on, we do a pretty good job of checking in during the rotation as well, like halfway through to see how things are going. Um, it's a little bit less formal than at the end, but um, I found so far that most of the specialists that I've worked with are also pretty receptive to feedback um, and they do try to incorporate the things that I was more interested in doing or participating in. Thank you. Tisha, can you say a little bit about that informal touching base? What, what do you do, for example, when you do that? Um, so I actually find that a lot of the people, like a lot of, um, attendings that I've worked with outside of the residency, they do a pretty good job halfway through to ask how I feel things are going and if they have feedback okay. for me. But if they don't, then, you know, like you would in medical school, we do encourage everyone to try and reach out halfway through to see if there's any like room for improvement, right? Either from us or if we do have feedback. Um, 
Yeah, like I was saying, I, I, I haven't found to this day that if I did have constructive feedback, that it wasn't received well. And I think so I've only been in the residency for about a year now. Um, and I feel like there have been some changes even in this past year, just depending on what like the residents wanted rotation to rotation. And, and that's true for like our faculty rotate, like our core rotations, as well as our more elective or um, other rotations. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Anything you wanna add, Antoinette? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the specialists um, are very, uh, what's the word, um, like, do like teaching us, I think, so they are, you know, we have open communication with them, um, with, like, the cardiologists and neurologists, everybody, they are willing to teach, so I think when you, you know, they really do give you feedback, or they, they ask, like, how can they do better, or they'll, you know, and then it's open for you to tell them. Um, what you kind of want to get out of the rotation too. So I think uh, we do have open communication with a lot of the faculty and staff at Hunterdon. Um, and yeah, like, I think we have a lot of opportunities to really get feedback from them also. Uh, so I'm a little distracted. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's very open. I think we have like a very close family like feel. Um, and you don't have to, even with specialists, I know you, you brought that up. So, you know, some specialists you feel like you can't really talk, talk to or reach out to. It's not really like that in our, in our hospital, like all the way up to like, you know, the surgeons and everything like that, you know, they are very receptive to us. They know that we're the only residents there. So they really do um, enjoy teaching us and they give us feedback. And um, I think it's very beneficial for our education. Awesome. Thank you. There was a vote of confidence there from your daughter, Antoinette. <laughs> what other questions do we have? What else can we answer for you? It does um does Hunterdon have any partnerships with like alternative healers like acupuncturists or chiropractors that you would often refer people to or is it just more people in the community that you know that you would refer patients to? So largely it is partners in the community. Um, we were actually just reviewing this at our session today. We keep a running list, a resource list of community partners. Um, so for example, if you wanted to use an integrative nutritionist or a nutritionist in, a, in our community, we've got three or four people that you can send folks to and you can provide the website and the phone number and the name and your patient plan that you're giving to your patient. If you want someone to teach clinical hypnosis for irritable bowel syndrome, for example, there's a couple of specific folks that we refer people to. When it comes to acupuncture, there's probably about 10 different acupuncture practitioners in our community. Um, Hunterdon is the only hospital within Hunterdon County, which is a relatively large sized county. And our offices are about 30, 30 minutes apart. So between the hospital and the two um, practice locations, we make an equilateral triangle of the sites. And our, our patients like to stay in their own home areas. So people who live in Frenchtown, Disha practices in Frenchtown, um, really don't wanna come down to where I'm in based and Antoinette are based in Lambertville. And our folks in Lambertville don't wanna travel half an hour up to Frenchtown. So we actually have to have a whole list of providers that'll work in both of these local communities to get folks to. So we've been, been brainstorming and um, putting those together. Um, it's what, about a three or four page document at this point. Um, and we also have collated online resources since a lot of folks during COVID were not going anywhere um, and we're staying home. So we have lists of providers who will work virtually. We have lists of good links of videos that you can use say for guided imagery or mind body or free cell phone apps um, that are vetted and validated, I would say, because you 
can certainly steer people to the wrong things on the internet just as well. Um, but yeah, we, we keep active resource lists. A lot of these folks, I find I get consult letters back or notification back. Um, so for example, we have someone who does community acupuncture who's based in Flemington, which is a great low price option. Uh, makes it more affordable for a lot of folks. Um, I will get information back from them when I refer a patient there, which is the same I would expect if I sent a patient to a urologist or if I sent a patient to the orthopedist. Um, and then we've created we've created some um, shortcuts and some save and loads within our electronic healthcare record to make documentation not as burdensome um, and quicker and easier as well. So a lot of institutional and structural support to make it easier to incorporate complementary um, therapists and techniques. So just all of those little things that get added on that make it a difference whether it is feasible um, to actually practice like this. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? I would want to, to approach again and if anybody doesn't have uh, questions, there is some kind of community outreach that the programs perform in terms of integrative medicine that go into the community in order to put on these techniques on, on practice. So I'm hearing two questions there, Rafael. I'm hearing about community outreach and how we partner with very, various folks in the community. Um, and there's a community medicine rotation, um, and I'm going to send that to um, the rest of my team here. Have either of yeah. you or any of you done your community medicine rotations? Okay, go ahead, Disha. So I'm actually on it right now. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we basically get to spend time with some of the resources that we have available in our community. Um, so for example, last week I was with our hospice team. Um, so I got to spend some time, you know, going to people's homes and experiencing that. Um, I was with the adult protective services for a day. Um, that was, it, I think in general, it kind of gives us a little bit more insight of like what these um, organizations and communities, uh, organiz organizations do in our community. Um, another thing that I did was I was with physical therapy with their home visits. So when I have my patients that I'm sending home from the hospital um, prescribed with home PT, what does that really entail? I got an opportunity to do that. Um, tomorrow I'm with developmental peds. So it's just like a broad um, kind of spectrum of things that are available to our residents um, and things that we recommend for them. And Outside of that, we also do have um, a community, I don't know the actual name for this, but a community outreach project in our second year um, that we do with our class. So me and Antoinette are in the same class and um, I don't know if I can reveal this because it's not <laughs> public knowledge just yet because we haven't told the whole residency what we're up to, but um, like our plan is to basically work with our um, seniors in the community and our our teenagers at the high school and create a program for both of them um, so that the seniors have some socialization um, and maybe even teach them some technology. Um, and the teenagers are kind of doing something to give back to the community as well. So that's, we're working on that project right now. So I know you also asked about community service. And yeah, I think those are the main points I wanted to mention. Wonderful. And I think right. every class does something a little bit different. So there's a there's a huge range there. And one of our other residents also um, spent some time during community medicine volunteering for America's Grow a Row, which we have in Hunterton County, which is um, uh, a man started a garden for his daughter and they ended up donating everything that they grew. And out of this simple thing, 
he um, developed an entire commercial farm. Um, I don't know how many acres, but many, many acres. All the food is donated to food banks um, in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. Um, and it is all staffed by volunteers and through donations. So I know periodically we've had our residents um, do a shift when there happens to be a harvest, right? When things need to be harvested, they need to need to be harvested. You can't wait three weeks. It's now or it's now. <laughs> Those are the options. Um, but that also lets lets people know about some of the community needs and get involved with some of those as well. It's part of community medicine. Thank you. I wanted to add one other thing. Um, I mentioned how important nutrition is. So we actually uh, organizationally decided um, after speaking with our residents, we realized that there's no consistent nutrition curriculum across most medical schools, that there's a huge range and variety um, in terms of knowledge base for nutrition and the effects of nutrition on human health and on various human um, chronic conditions. So um, not just in our IMR track, but for all residents in academic day, there is a nutrition curriculum over the three years that you're here. So, which is didactic as well as hands-on. So um, recently we talked about some of the basics of macronutrients and micronutrients, um, and then had a practical uh, smoothie contest applying the recent knowledge. Um, not sure I remember who the winner was, but it was a, it was a heated battle. <laughs> so that's another component. Um, and some of the mind-body techniques make it into our wellness. Because again, if we don't take care of ourselves, then we're not going to have much to give to our patients. And many of the concepts of integrative medicine, if you learn them for your own self-care, you can then start to use these components, not just for yourself and your family, but then also teach these to your patients. Um, so multiple uses. So there's a question about how OMT is incorporated into the curriculum that I think I'm seeing coming up. Let me pull that up here. Um, well, OMT might not be what we traditionally think of as integrative medicine. I think it can certainly be. Um, Harrison, I would completely agree with you. Um, so we are du duly certified um, for um, osteopaths and for allopaths. And there is during the academic day, um, a fully integrated um, osteopathic uh, training sessions. And we have sports medicine clinic at both of our offices and all residents, whether they are MD or DO, rotate through our sports medicine clinics um, just as well. So in addition to OMT techniques, that are being taught. There's also things like joint injections. Um, and you also have the opportunity to attend various football games where we are team physicians and to practice hands on. Um, I'm going to throw this up to the hundred and team. Um, if you want to add anything about your own experiences here. Sure. I'm, I went to an osteopathic school, so, and I'm interested in continuing uh, osteopathic medicine, uh, you know, in my career. So we do have a lot of opportunity to integrate that uh, in our clinics or even with um, education. You know, we are inclusive, so we do teach our um, MD counterparts osteopathic treatments, and they actually learn them, and they could do them in the office, too. So everybody from kind of um, all levels of knowledge of osteopathic medicine is able to kind of improve their skills uh, at our program. Uh, I guess we do integrate osteopathic medicine into a lot of um, our sessions of, in education. So, you know, it's just always encouraged uh, as kind of a baseline, even for like an, for like our DO students, um, even if you're doing a presentation or a noon conference um, about, you know, I don't know, anything like palynephritis, like it, it's nice to incorporate either osteopathic principles or any potential treatments in your um, presentation, because there's a lot of ways to integrate osteopathic medicine um, in general. 
to, um, you know, just our conventional medicine all the time. So I think uh, there is a lot of opportunity to integrate that um, even in the IMR curriculum also, I think there is an, a section of for osteopathic medicine. Um, yep. I haven't gotten to that part yet, but they, um, you know, it is incorporated into the, the program also. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot of uh, ties to osteopathic medicine if that's what you're interested in. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, Antoinette. So I'm an MD. I've been learning from my osteopathic colleagues and that's attendings and residents alike. Um, we all have things to teach one another and absolutely have started um, integrating some osteopathic techniques for my upper respiratory infection patients, for my headache patients, um, as I get comfortable with my skills. So very definitely. Thanks for that question, Harrison. Anything you wanted to add, Disha? Uh, just that I've also enjoyed learning it. I am an um, allopath, like I went to an allopathic school, um, but like Antoinette was saying, I do have an equal opportunity to learn it in residency. Um, so I'm looking forward to incorporating it into my practice. Likewise. Sort of think about all the different techniques as having more tools in my toolbox. I can't use the same tool for every single patient. That would not be a patient-centered approach. So I am looking to partner with every one of my patients to help them with health and with healing um, and being their best selves. Um, and that's not the same answer across the board. So there's a lot more nuance. And the more tools I have um, to work with each patient, um, the more likely we are to be effective together. That's sort of the way I look at it. Any other questions that we can answer for you all this evening? Well, sounds like we've we've covered the burning questions for tonight. Scott, I think you have our contact information, right? Our emails. Yeah. Um, so, so thanks everyone, and thank you, Dr. Meyer and Hundred and your Hundred and team for for doing this great presentation. I, I we can make sure to get the contact information for Hundred and out to everyone who registered tonight. And if you have any follow-up questions, you can go ahead and ask. Absolutely. We appreciate all of your time and thank you all for joining us and wish you all be well. Thanks everyone.